Not to take you back to a time you might not want to be taken back to, but we're just following the science. How many times did we hear that as we were getting regular updates as to our various governments' responses to COVID-19? We're just following the science. It was something that was drilled into our heads to be sure, and if we had a nickel for every time we heard it, well, we'd have a lot of nickels. But were there any illusions attached to that? And further, what are the implications of that consistent COVID-19 messaging? Patrick Fafard is a professor in the faculties of social sciences and medicine, as well as a senior investigator in the Global Strategy Lab at the University of Ottawa, joins us to talk about this. Patrick, good morning. Good morning. Was this messaging, just following the science, in any way a deflection of political responsibility here? Absolutely. If you think about it, if I say to you, oh, I'm just following the advice of this other person, I'm shifting responsibility to that other person. And that's essentially what uh, politicians both here in, in Ontario, in Canada, and in other countries were doing when they said, well, we're just following the advice of our scientific advisors. And to be fair, that advice should absolutely be taken into in, into a account when we're making decisions, right? Absolutely. Uh, the claim here is not that you don't want them to to take the advice on board, the cl- but rather the claim is you want them to, not only you want them to, but this is what they actually do. They take the scientific advice and they balance it against any number of other considerations. So when Doug Ford and other politicians would say, well, I'm just following the science, it's not, it's not a credible statement, but more importantly, we don't want them to just follow the science. We want them to, to take on that really tough, tough uh, job of balancing what would maximize a population health, what would minimize the number of deaths, what would keep businesses open, what would uh, be best for kids in school, et cetera, et cetera. Those are really difficult trade-offs that only politicians can make, and that's, that's why we elect, them. We, make, we elect them to make those tough choices. Right, and, and in absence of making those decisions themselves, if indeed, and I agree entirely with your premise here, that it was a deflection of that responsibility, what ends up happening then is the scientific experts become, for lack of a better term, the scapegoats here. Uh, yes, and that varies from, from jurisdiction, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So here in Ontario, uh, most, uh, and indeed in countries around the world, uh, before the pandemic, most Canadians could not name the chief medical officer of health in their province. But in Ontario, we quickly learned the name of Dr. Williams and his successor, Dr. Moore, um, but in some places like Alberta, it was even more extreme. And, and Albertans actually thought that the chief medical officer, Dr. Hinshaw, was the one making the decisions. Um, this is A, it's not, that's A, that not, that's not the case. But B, it's, it, it shifts responsibility onto these people who not only are unelected and therefore not accountable, but they actually don't have the ability to uh, defend, defend themselves the way politicians do. So to simply say, well, I'm just following the science is not a is not a formula we want to encourage. Does this then, Patrick, undermine the public's trust in these scientific advisors, in these chief medical officers of health, et cetera? Uh, absolutely, um, because we saw this repeatedly when people would contrast what they think Dr. Williams or Dr. Moore was advising the government, or they would contrast the advice from the Ontario Science Table with what any number of other experts would go into the public square and say, well, no, I think we should do this. The moment you start getting a gap between what the government's advisors are saying or what the government's official policy is and what the critics are saying, people begin to scratch their heads and go, well, hold it, you both can't be right. And it has, you're right, it has the effect of uh, undermining the confidence that people have in the government's scientific advisors. Can we determine in any way how this messaging became so ubiquitous, why it became the line that got trotted out again and again and again? Um, Yes, Um, and there's a couple of reasons, some simpler, some more complicated. Um, At its core, it boils down to the fact that for over 100 years, governments in Canada and elsewhere have created something like the chief medical officer. In the United States, for a long time, it was the, the role of the Surgeon General. And the idea here is 
um, we, the government, need to make really difficult decisions that are that maximize public health or minimize the spread of infectious disease. We want to signal to the public that we're making those decisions on uh, good public health or good medical or good scientific basis, and it's not just politics. Um, and by and large, the model was successful. Uh, but it, the model never anticipated and doesn't really deal well with something as widespread as a pandemic where everybody in the society is affected. In those situations, you can't make it out to be a question of the best available science. You have to acknowledge right from the get-go, this is really tough stuff, and it takes a, a, these are difficult decisions, and we must involve the politicians, and we must hold them accountable. And that's what was done in some places, um, but in those jurisdictions where it was just a repeated follow the science, that was clearly not what they were, they were doing quite the opposite, and with bad effects on the people who were trying to provide the advice. Do we need, uh, and I've heard some calls for this already, do we need a public inquiry into our handling of COVID-19? We have had public inquiries uh, in response to um, disasters and scandals and problems of, of a much, much, much smaller scope and scale. It's important never, ever to forget that uh, tens of thousands of people were affected by the pandemic just in Ontario. A whole bunch of people died unnecessarily. If that isn't in of itself grounds for an inquiry, I don't know what is. But more importantly, you know, there's an expression, never waste a good crisis. We can learn about what works and what doesn't work and what we did well and what we didn't do well. And part of that is figuring out, so what role do we want the chief medical officer to play anyway? And we reasonable people disagree on this. So we have to have a conversation and just and come to a conclusion as to whether we need to make amendments and changes to the way we organize public health. There have been many conversations around this perceived or you know, perhaps not even perceived, but true erosion of trust we have seen in public institutions, elected leaders, etc. Has there been, do you believe or, or have you learned that there's been a similar erosion of trust in the scientific community? And if so, can it be repaired? Um, The data, lots of survey data, lots of research on this. We know that there is a broad secular trend over many years where declining government, trust in government is down, trust in media is down. The trust in science question is a bit trickier. depends how you ask the question. Um, it's lower than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. There's no question about that. But what gets interesting is if you ask, um, for example, the people who enjoy the highest trust are uh, family doctors. So, you know, if you ask the question, do you trust your doctor, people will say yes in very high numbers. Um, If you ask them, do you trust those people at the university, uh, those experts at the university, those there's, again, relatively high levels of trust. It's much more complicated when you ask about the government scientific advisors because they became high profile and they became a bit politicized and they became a bit, you know, a subject of of commentary in in of themselves. And so so, so trust in in government and government science is lower than it would have been three or four years ago. Um, Can it be turned around? Yes. Um, There's some sort of standard approaches and one is a certain degree of transparency but here we, we ran into a really big problem. During the pandemic, we heard a lot, well, show me the advice that the, Dr. Williams or Dr. Moore was giving to the government. You know, show, show us your homework. And yeah, I suppose in principle, um, radical transparency would be good, but that's not the way we organize government in, in Canada. We have cabinet and we have cabinet secrecy for a reason. You don't like making decisions in a fishbowl. And so how we reconcile on the one hand uh, our existing me- structure of government where there's an idea that cabinet can deliberate in private and not have uh, do it in a fishbowl with um, a, a, this really deeply felt public concern. Well, tell us the, the basis on which you made this decision. That's a really tough n- nut to crack, how we would reconcile those two things. And again, that would be one of the things we'd want to have, a uh, conversation we'd want to have as part of a public inquiry. Surely, when the next health crisis emerges, and we know that it will, we want elected leaders and the scientific community, those scientific advisors, to work collaboratively on the solution to that health crisis, right? Like, I think what we're getting at here is making sure 
that the approach, I don't know if it looks different, but that the the approach is certainly a unified approach between the scientific community and the elected community? I disagree. Okay. Um, in, in, a, in a perfect world, yes. But in reality, um, first of all, there's no such thing as one science. So when it comes to an infectious disease outbreak, you get a different answer if you ask uh, an epidemiologist or a virologist or a family doctor. They all might have a different, slightly, different, slightly or big difference in views. But more importantly, it's never just about the science. And I wouldn't expect there to be consensus between uh, scientific advisors and, and the government writ large. Because, I mean, for example, the government here in Ontario wrestled a great deal with how to balance, you know, letting businesses reopen with maximizing public health. That's a tough call. So you, I don't think there's going to be alignment between politicians and scientists in all cases, nor would you want there to be. There will be a role, though, obviously, and what we're getting at here is perhaps less of that deflecting the responsibility back onto whatever scientific community is providing the guidance in that particular case. Yes. Yes. And so that's where we have to think carefully about the different models that were used, uh, both in Canada and other countries. So, for example, in Ontario, on the fly, we created the science table, but we already had Public Health Ontario. Um, In BC, they have BC CDC. In Quebec, they have a a public health institute. Do these things work? Do they make a difference? Do they enhance public trust? Do they work well with politicians? How do we we manage the inevitable conflict between uh, what what politicians think might be best and what the scientists think might be best? These are all things that we need to investigate further because um, we can do better in a pandemic. We can do better the next time there's a public health crisis. And so that's the whole point. Let's study how we organized ourselves and see if we can figure out which approaches are best and which are less effective. Really interesting stuff. Patrick, I uh, certainly appreciate your time on the show today. Thank you for being here. You're very welcome. Patrick Fafard is a professor in the faculties of social sciences and medicine, as well as a senior investigator in the Global Strategy Lab at the University of Ottawa. Uh, He, along with a research director at York University, Adele Casola, co-authored a piece in the conversation entitled The Illusion and Implications of Just Following the Science, COVID-19 Messaging.